So, uh, did your batch had a reunion recently, or? No, I think oh, probably a senior maybe. Okay. Uh, not not our batch. I think I heard uh, Professor Chaturvedi or Professor Thomas was talking about that. Right. <laughs> I think the previous batch there were a lot of uh, localites, so probably they could have managed it. Okay. But we should we should also do that. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, uh, uh, welcome, Doctor Anupam Yadav. Uh, Sorry, uh, uh, Saxena Sir. Yeah. So we we are very happy to have you in this meet. Thank you so much for the invitation. Really appreciate that. It's a very different feeling, right? Yeah. So you, actually, you, you actually, give actually, to different platforms, but it's yeah. a very different feeling to like uh, connect back to your alma mater and. Uh, and understand what's going on there. Yeah. So actually, we started like a trial in the beginning. We started with our faculty colleagues in the first session. So you may be aware, you would have seen in the social media, it's like a freshers, you know, fresh talents of the department introduction. Then, you know, we started slowly developing, thinking that, you know, let's expand to alumni because, you know, there are so many alumni of IIT Rurki who are here and there. But, you know, they are not, you know, uh, associated with the department many times. Absolutely. You know, there is that's, some, that's, a, yeah. that's, that's a great initiative, Dr. Thomas. I really appreciate that. Yeah, right. because many people, think... yeah, many people don't come forward and then say loudly that, you know, I am an IIT Rurki alumni. So maybe I think that, you know, now we have to tell them that you are our alumni. So you have to have, you know, you have to be more aggressive and courageous to say that you are IIT Rurki alumni. Yeah, I think yes. I think that's that's fair. But at the same time, uh, sometime we move down in our life, and uh, yeah. some of there's a gap yeah. connecting back. But I think this yeah, is a yeah. great platform to uh, not only connect back but collaborate. Like uh, Tagun is doing wonderfully well in IIT yeah. Kanpur, right? So he thank you very much. Marvelous work, which I thank keep you. following. He was one year junior to us. Uh, and there are several others uh, we know that they have been doing wonderful. This is an opportunity to also connect back and collaborate in whatever different possibilities. Yeah, yeah. Actually, that is why you know our director, Professor Ajit Chaturvedi, is also surprised to see chemistry alumni are there in different fields. You know, in biotechnology, bioengineering, civil engineering, environmental engineering. So that is mainly because of the you know diversity of the chemistry department. I think you know back to date, you know people in the department were uh, very popular in different fields, particularly in the environmental science, analytical chemistry, sensors. So I think that also exposed our you know students in different areas. All right. Yeah. So uh, may, may we start this meeting? Yes, please go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I think that it is time to start. Uh, welcome all the alumni members and participants, participant colleagues, students, and uh, chairperson of this session 11, Professor Pallavi Debnath. Uh, happy Independence Day to all of you. This is a holiday, but I think that you know many of you have joined us. Despite you know other you know commitments, we are very much thankful to. Uh, the speakers and then the speakers of the evening, Dr. Anubhav Saxena. So he is a very prolific, you know, a personality. He is going to share with us in the evening session the opportunities or the opportunities for the chemistry graduates in the industry. That will be a wonderful uh, information for the students, particularly uh, from the you know who are participating in this event. I welcome one and all one more time and then now i invite professor pallavi debnath uh, to chair this session and lead the session professor pallavi debnath thank you professor thomas welcome you all happy independence day to all of you today we have distinguished speakers in this session let's introduce our first speaker from iit kanpur professor tarun gupta so here I go by his uh, bio sketch. Tarun Gupta is currently NC Nigam Chair Professor in the Department of Civil Engineering and Affiliated Faculty Member of the Design Program and Center for Environmental Science and Engineering at IIT Kanpur. 
He completed his MSc Chemistry from IIT Rookie and Environmental Science and Engineering from IIT Bombay. He earned his doctorate in Environmental Health from Harvard University School of Public Health. A submicron aerosol sampler designed and developed by Tarun has been commercialized by Envirotech Instruments Private Limited Delhi and is being marketed as PM1 sampler model APM577. Tarun has also transferred a technology to Bark Mumbai for retrofitting an existing high volume PM10 sampler into a high volume PM2.5 sampler with only my, minor operational changes and with very additional low additional cost. IITK has also transferred this technology to a startup named Airshed. He has authored more than 125 international peer reviewed journal articles and edited five books. He has filed four print patents and six design patents and has supervised seven PhD students and 33 MTech students. He has won many awards, including INA Young Engineer, INSA Medals for Young Scientists, NASA's Focus Young Scientist, INA Innovator and Entrepreneur Award. Recently, he was awarded BNMM Award by IIT. Uh, today, he speaks on the role of a chemist in understanding and mitigating current air pollution problems. It's over to Professor Tarun. Please. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'll share my slides now. Is it visible to everyone? Yes, Tarun. We can see that. Yeah, yeah. It's good. You can proceed. Okay, I'll request all of you to kindly mute so that we have less noise uh, in the system. And a very happy Independence Day. Uh, it's a matter of pride for me that uh, on this day, and I have been given this opportunity to speak to uh, my uh, teachers from IIT, Roorkee. And it was University of Roorkee when I attended uh, the MSc. So I was from 96 to 98 batch. And I'm happy that uh, some of my seniors, like Anubhav and my batchmate Anil, they have also uh, are going to speak or already have spoken in this occasion. And uh, I'll just briefly tell what my journey was, uh, academic journey. So I started uh, my BSc in industrial chemistry from uh, University of Delhi. After that, I came to Ruki and specialized in organic, uh, especially in polymer chemistry. Then went on to do my MTEC from IIT Bombay in uh, Center for Environmental Science and Engineering. And during my MTEC, I went for a nine month DART scholarship to Technical University of Dresden. And that was mechanical processing uh, department. I took my GREs there. And then after coming back to IIT Bombay, defended my thesis, briefly worked as a project staff for three months and then uh, joined Harvard School of Public Health. Uh, there was environmental health department. So after completing my PhD for in 2004, I continued as a postdoctoral fellow in Harvard School of Public Health, but did mostly field studies in different coal power plants in the US. So we covered three power plants there to look at the toxicity of uh, emissions from uh, old coal power plants. After that, in 2006, I joined the Department of Civil Engineering at uh, IIT Kanpur. And now it has been more than 14 years uh, at IIT Kanpur. And uh, I'll, I have put together a kind of bunch of snapshots of different uh, research areas or topics or projects that we touched upon. So it may not be a coherent story, but I was very ambitious. It's like a small child who has made like uh, a colorful picture and wants to show everyone. So I have similar kind of feeling because uh, I want to show my teachers. Uh, some of them are still there, like uh, Professor Bina Gupta, Professor Morya, uh, Professor Ravi Bhushan, uh, Professor Arun Goel, Professor Anil Kumar. That uh, this is what I have done, and a small pat on the back will be a great motivation for me to move forward in the same zeal and enthusiasm. So uh, the title of my talk is Role of a Chemist in Understanding and Mitigating Current Air Pollution Problems. So uh, it could be a myopic view, but uh, this is this, my story, so I'll be happy to share this. Uh, yes, uh, OK. Yeah, so this is the framework. Can you see uh, the second slide? So this is air pollution and human health. Uh, 
okay great so um, what i wanted to show like in which zone, uh, domain i actually work so we have different sources out there uh, could be thermal power plants vehicular emission road dust emission emission from various industry and maybe like from as indoor pollution from cooking stoves tobacco smoking and so on all of this mixed together and present a very complex uh, mixture what we are inhaling either if we are outdoors or indoors in our houses and this we term as ambient air pollution now ambient air pollution is what we are exposed so we call it human exposure to find out what are the health effects from this exposure there are two branches of science toxicology and epidemiology which tells using different tools uh, what are the end health effects from this exposure what could be the mechanistic pathways and uh, if we talk about epidemiology then they try to establish causal relationship in terms of uh, maybe quantitative or qualitative terms once we know what are the health effects then the role of risk assessment comes uh, we always try to do some economic analysis and cost benefit analysis and see like what are the health effects how much is the cost for that to the public to the uh, government uh, because of hospital admission loss of work and so on and then we weigh like if we put control technologies then what are the cost on these sources so one of these step is also to prioritize which pollution or which source of pollution to tackle first which will give us maximum health benefits and benefits to the uh, public at large so then the role of control technology come so as far as my brief career is concerned i have mostly focused on measurement of ambient air pollution and then developed few control technologies so i'll show you what we have done uh, this is again an overview uh, probably like very simple everyone knows about it that we have a bunch of sources from which emissions are concerned from air pollution context uh, we call them primary pollutants which uh, are coming out in terms of gases emission or particulate emission from different sources uh, there's a fair bit of uh, transformation uh, physical chemical transformation which is carrying out in the atmosphere because of the presence of sunlight we have a radical a uh, huge suit of photochemistry which is going on and then uh, because of presence of uh, moisture or water droplets or rain fog we have a bunch of aqueous chemistry which goes on and that causes transformation of these primary pollutant into secondary pollutant which are produced because of interaction so very simple reactions that we study in uh, the uh, our lab like polymerization oligomerization oxidation reduction all that happens in the atmosphere so actually we are kind of unraveling what is happening in the nature and then synthetic organic chemistry or other branches are actually uh, inspired but by, by absorbing or observing the nature in a very very fine manner now i'll pick one particular source which is diesel exhaust i could have very well chosen uh, coal power plants but uh, just for the sake of simplicity i wanted to cover one source so diesel exhaust uh, now us epa and several other organization has termed diesel exhaust as a uh, carcinogenic material or uh, human carcinogen if you want to understand simply what exactly it is consisting of so there are a bunch of gas species which comes out from diesel exhaust these uh, of course oxygen in small amount carbon dioxide carbon monoxide oxides of nitrogen no no2 Uh, oxides of sulfur volatile organic compounds and some low molecular weight hydrocarbons which are in gas phase because of the high temperature at which they are emitted now in terms of particulate phase uh, we have definitely the elemental core uh, of the soot soot is again like a mixture of several organic and inorganic compounds there are about uh, several adsorbed organics on the particulate surface on the soot there are uh, traces of sulfate nitrate some uh, refractory materials and other trace materials and then in terms of organics uh, we call something as soa soluble organic fraction out of which uh, polyaromatic hydrocarbons especially the nitro and oxidized derivatives are the compounds which are most toxic and are of interest as far as uh, their 
measurement or their removal or their uh, <clears throat> mitigation is concerned from the uh, various uh, health and other benefits which are involved. So I'll talk about that in a later slide. Now uh, this slide little uh, looks little complex, but uh, before starting this, we want to tell that what happens inside an internal combustion engine is basically a chemical reaction. So we have a fuel which is combustible. We are providing oxygen uh, in the form of air at, and we are creating high temperature and pressure condition under which it will combust. And in the in term, it's an exothermic reaction. So it will produce huge amount of energy, which we use uh, in the form of mechanical energy by moving the piston, which is connected to crankshaft and crankshafts are connected to the, uh, <clears throat> to the wheels and then the engine moves. And the reason why we have pollutant formation taking place is because we do not allow this chemical reaction to complete. We literally freeze the kinetics at some point. So that's why like uh, there are pockets inside the uh, engine combustion zone where like lack of oxygen leads to formation of either volatile organic gases or maybe soot formation, which we call as particulate formation. Of these, particulate formation has been of interest largely because of the complex nature in which it is formed. There have been both theoretical as well as uh, experimental studies. People have now literally like uh, looked inside the engine. So optical engines are there in the uh, research area where they try to look at the emissions by using different parametric investigations and the kind of fuels which might be there. So this slide basically tells you there's a mixture of air, diesel, lubricating oil. The initial set of particles which are forming are very, very tiny in sizes. So there are a bunch of them when they come together, they coalesce and become bigger. They form stable particles on which other gases condense and then you see the soot particles. So it is very complex. You have the probably the elemental carbon core at the center. You have adsorbed organics on the top. You have some amount of sulfate and fly ash and so on. Uh, there are studies which try to hypothesize like what is the chemical nature and what is the mechanistic of diesel formation. So what majority of the people agree is uh, ethane molecule. So C2H2 is the starting molecule which come together and they form ring compounds pretty much like graphitic structure. Uh, they are planar compounds, then they start rolling over, make rows and assume a spherical kind of structure. These spherules come together, form an agglomerate and this is what we call as a uh, kind of uh, soot material on which further organics get condensed. Uh, there are various steps like pyrolysis, nucleation, surface growth, agglomeration, uh, physical chemical changes, mostly in terms of oxidation, which happens by the time these particles are coming out of the tailpipe. Now, this was how the particle formation takes place. Now, what we are encountered with are the health effects, largely because of particles coming out of variety of sources. I discuss only one source, but the major uh, health effects that we see are asthma, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and lung cancer. Uh, we also see that nanoparticles, uh, especially like ultrafine particles are associated with causing cardiovascular disease. The reason people have found out is like, uh, they are just one order of magnitude bigger than the gas. So as the gas exchange takes place in our lungs where oxygen and CO2 get exchanged because of the expansion and contraction of uh, our uh, parenchymal tissue, uh, similarly, very tiny particles behave or mimic like gas molecules are and are able to cross the alveolar membrane and go into the bloodstream. And the major cardiovascular health effects are arrhythmia and ischemia because of air pollution uh, exposure. And this has been validated through various uh, studies uh, which have been published. Uh, the landmark epidemiological studies started with Harvard 680 study and then later on Brigham's uh, women nurses study and various other cohort study where they use bunch of uh, observational data and some uh, health 
data and they try to find a causal relationship between the health effects and the uh, those effects causing aging so air pollution has been shown uh, to cause detrimental health effects in fact some matrix are also available like where they say like uh, say 1.5 uh, microgram per meter cube increase in PM2.5 is going to increase the relative risk of getting a particular disease by so much percentage. So there are a variety of studies which are out there. In fact, those were the sources or maybe the proof evidence based on which the ambient air quality standards were set for particulate matter. So we see like earlier, uh, if we talk about our own country, the CPCB initially had standards only for total suspended particulate, then they came to PM10, and then we have now standards for PM2.5. Hopefully in the future, we'll also have standards for PM1, and maybe as far as the vehicles are concerned, we are going to Euro 6 or Paris stage 6. So there will be standards in terms of the number of emission, which is coming out from the engine exhaust. Uh, just to give a reference, so this is the diameter of the typical human hair, which is about 60 micron in diameter. So you see relatively what is PM10 and PM2.5. So uh, what I tell students in my class is PM10 is something you can visibly see. Like, uh, so if you are looking at the windshield of your car and you have dust particles deposited and you're looking directly away from the sun rays, those particles will shine. And the smallest particle you see is probably PM10. Below that, something you cannot see with your naked eye. Okay. Now, uh, what people have tried worldwide, especially at Harvard School of Public Health and John Hopkins and a few other places like uh, USAPA, they try to see the health effects from particles emitting from a particular source like uh, diesel exhaust or fly ash from a coal power plant, or they try to put mixture of these particles in the lab and generate them in chambers and expose animals uh, to find out what are the health effects and especially they want to see what is the effect on their lungs, kidney, liver and brain and maybe other vital organs. Uh, there is a particular study which is called as uh, concentrated ambient concentrated ambient particle systems uh, which was actually part of my PhD study at Harvard. So we developed for US EPA uh, Harvard Ultrafine Concentrated Ambient Particle System the idea behind this is like uh, they wanted to study like for a set of animals like how the health effects will be accelerated and see like if a worth of year worth of pollution is created in few hours okay so these are acute health effects that they wanted to study and this instrument basically takes uh, ambient air remove larger particles by impaction uh, takes only tiny particles below say one micron and then using a series of virtual impactors they are concentrated in a small stream they are concentrated almost 100 times and in the process uh, we are also using condensational growth to take care of nanoparticles which can be grown to a bigger size then we are using a bunch of heaters to bring the particles back to their original size and then you see like a, a small mice inside a inhalation chamber and these are several small mice in various chambers so we have an exposed group and we have a control group so control group is only breathing clean air and exposed group is uh, breathing maybe like 80 times higher concentration of nanoparticles say below 300 nanometer and then they study various health effects looking at chemiluminescence after dissecting the lungs, looking at uh, their heartbeat variation using a telemeter and so on. These are a bunch of uh, gas and particle measuring devices. Here we see a human being, actually a volunteer inside a chamber. So for these conditions, uh, the testing uh, uh, levels are not that high. The pollution created is much more milder, but and they are uh, using only healthy volunteers, they are exposed for a couple of hours and they look before and after their pulmonary or respiratory functions and see like uh, what are the health effects. Sometimes blood is also taken out to look at uh, presence of reactive oxygen species in their blood and so on. This is myself with this instrument which was part of my uh, PhD thesis. So 
Moving on to what work uh, we have carried out in last 16 years at ID Kanpur, and maybe some glimpses I'll show. So we started working with inertial impactors. Uh, these are basically mechanical devices, very simple in design, but they are able to separate particles or aerosol in the air based on their aerodynamic sizes. So there are different variations of impactor. Uh, I'm showing a cross-sectional view of an impactor nozzle and the substrate. So you can see the nozzle is like a funnel shape. Okay, so you can imagine that it's a round nozzle, and I'm just showing a sliced transverse uh, section of it. What we do is uh, air containing aerosols, which are having both bigger and smaller particles, is accelerated through the nozzle. And then as the air is passing through the nozzle, it gets accelerated and streamlined. We put an obstruction right in front of it. So this is an impaction substrate, which is kept right in front of the um, accelerating nozzle. What happens, this causes the air streamlines to bend at sharp angles, typically 90 degree angle. So particles which are small enough are able to bend with the bending streamlines and particles which are large because of their inertia, they continue in the straight pathway and are not able to bend and they get collected. So the theory behind this is from Navier-Stokes equation, from computational fluid dynamics uh, uh, theory, but there are a lot of variation which we can do through experimental design by choosing the kind of uh, nozzle geometry, the distance between the exit and the impaction substrate using different kind of material for impaction substrate and that is what we did uh, for various studies so i'll skip this because these are a bunch of equations that uh, are directly derived from the navier stokes equation and this was our uh, laboratory setup so which we set up uh, to characterize or to evaluate and and keep on improving the design of impactors so we have a three section. One is the aerosol generation section. Then we have a testing rig, which is having basically a hollow tube with upstream and downstream ports. We have an optical particle counter, which is basically a light scattering device to count and size the particles. We kept an impactor to be calibrated or evaluated in the middle. And we have a differential pressure meter, a HEPA filter to protect a flow meter like rotometer and bunch of control valves and vacuum pump. So air is being sucked through the system. Uh, we had bunch of other pumps here and there. The idea was to generate aerosol, which is uh, polydispersed in nature. That means it has particles of different sizes and size distribution is pretty wide. Then we pass it through an impactor, which is going to remove particles above a certain size from the stream, uh, which will be removed on the impaction substrate. And whatever is coming down will be particles below a specific size. So idea is in an impactor, these smaller particles can be collected on an after filter, and then you can carry out various kind of uh, chemical analysis or toxicological analysis on those particles. Okay. Uh, this is the lab setup which was uh, there's an optical particle counter uh, which i showed earlier which we use uh, to characterize the particle size and the number concentration so basically inside we have uh, in this instrument a laser source and we have a light trap we look at uh, as the particles are entering so you imagine that the particles are entering from uh, you, from the 90% angle, that means from my mouth all the way going into the screen, okay? And then as the particle passes through the beam, it causes a, a scattering and this scattering is measured at a 90 degree angle, okay? And by passing particles of known sizes like polystyrene latex particles or dolomite particles or Arizona cores and fine dust, this instrument can be calibrated what will be the signal for particles of a particular size and refractive index. And once it is calibrated, it can be used for any ambient particles. And then it will tell you what is the size of the particle based on the scattering. And it will also count the particles. So number of scattering signals will give you the count of the particles. So by that, you can find out what is the size distribution. So this is like the size distribution typical
typically seen. Uh, so what you have is aerodynamic diameter in micron on the x-axis, particle concentration in number of particles per liter. So uh, this is uh, almost a million particles when we have 10 raised per 6. So you see the error bar shows the stability of the size distribution. That means uh, if you have a higher uh, error bar at the bottom, that means these are very big particles, small in number. And from experiment to experiment, there are some variations which are expected. But overall, we see a, a good smooth size distribution. When we go to dry aerosol generation system, so the first one was where sodium chloride uh, nebulized particles. The second is dry aerosol generation system where we used uh, talcum powder initially and then we went to dolomite which uh, was like a spheroid particles and these you have very stable size distribution and we were able to characterize the impactor very nicely. So I'm showing the final efficiency curve for an impaction that a PM1 sampler that we developed. Here is the body of the sampler, here are various parts of it. What you see very nicely is like uh, <clears throat> uh, the impactor cuts off particles which are one micron and below very nicely. That means it removes all the particles above one micron almost with more than 95% collection efficiency. So what we end up on an after filter is our particles only which are sub micron in nature that is less than one micron and it works at 10 liters per minute. So typically our breathing, breathing rate varies from 10 to 16 to if you are running, it can go up to like 20, 25 liters per minute. So we chose 10 liters per minute, which will mimic our breathing rates at resting conditions. The next thing we carried out was to look at what are the sources which are dominating in Kanpur. So this triangle shows the position of Kanpur. And then we have a bunch of industrial and other air pollution sources which are spread across the state. What we did was uh, we sampled using this sampler. And initially we collected uh, on a substrate, uh, Teflon based substrate particles, <coughs> excuse me, or uh, air pollution, um, which is less than one micron for eight hours duration. And this such studies were carried out for 100 days spread over an year so this was done in 2008-2009 year framework so one of the mtech students worked on that and then these filters were subjected for chemical analysis for anions so we use ion chromatography for elements we use inductively optical emission spectroscopy later on we also procured ecoc analysis so uh, the ecoc is uh, Instrument is very similar to TGA, DTA instrument that uh, most of you might be familiar with. And then later on, we also use HPLC and GCMS to find out what are the polyaromatic hydrocarbons and so on. But if you look at the average value, you see that uh, this is how the average concentration of various chemical species look. So you have a huge amount of sodium, ammonium, potassium, calcium, magnesium, fluoride, chloride, nitrate, sulfate, uh, primary organic aerosol, secondary organic aerosol, elemental carbon, and some amount of un un unidentified material. So large of it, large part of it could be refractory material or could be water bound to the molecules, which is difficult to analyze using bulk chemical analysis techniques. What we see on the right bottom is a meteorological windrose plot. So if we couple this and put through several models, uh, what we also need to know is like uh, these chemicals which we have measured like uh, the metal, they actually are signatures, source signatures of various uh, major air pollution sources. So if a particular ratio of nickel to lead is present, I can tell this might be the possible sources. Okay. So some of the sources I have listed here. For example, for coal power plants, we look at selenium and arsenic uh, and mercury if we are able to identify. Similarly, if we are looking at road dust, then we look for um, sodium, potassium, lead. If uh, even though lead has been phased out, but a lot of lead is still there in the road dust. And uh, there are similar like um, 
repository or inventory which is present which can tell you what are the sources there and we pass it through complex uh, principal component analysis software which are available uh, in the literature open literature to find out what are the possible sources which are there so some of the source apportionment tools are like uh, pmf positive matrix factorization unmix and pca uh, pcef and these are basically mathematical tools which work on mass balance principle and whatever we have measured at the sampling site uh, based on chemical signature mass concentration and various equations they try to find out what could be the likely sources which satisfy this situation okay since we have measured it over a long period like over one year we can also do source apportionment seasonal specific but then the statistical power goes down because the number of samples are low uh, what we see here this is for kanpur we see the major sources being uh, coal power plants and uh, brick kilns uh, secondary sources which produce sulfate nitrate uh, interesting thing was crustal dose uh, crustal road dust and vehicular emissions are also important sources so uh, so far we had not done any organic analysis but this is how a typical filter at kanpur looks like so this is probably what all of us might be breathing because this is worth eight or ten hours of sampling. Okay, uh, we tried to characterize some of the polyaromatic hydrocarbons, which are listed as uh, priority pollutants, because many of these are known human carcinogen. So this was probably one of the earlier studies, uh, as far as uh, Kanpur and Delhi were concerned, where like uh, PHS and ambient air were measured by IR group and then our collaborators at IIT Delhi, Professor Ghazala Habib. And then uh, we also tried to give a snapshot of how many of these are two ring compounds on bulk, how many of the are three rings and four rings uh, aromatic compounds. But looking at the ambient concentration of as high as 124 nanogram per meter cube, and if we look at together, the complete uh, phs they were pretty high considering the ambient air quality standards which have been set forth uh, this is another snapshot of a study where we looked at uh, the post monsoon and pre winter case so nowadays like people are talking about crop residue burning coming from punjab and haryana field because of quick uh, way of removing this uh, material which is not of much use to them and they want to the fields to be ready for the next crop to be sowed in so that produces huge amount of uh, organics so we looked at um, wa water soluble organic carbon which is coming out from these fields and then this these are measurements done at kanpur so using a bunch of uh, wind trajectory studies and chemical analysis we were able to establish the source to be punjab and Har haryana fields we saw very strong correlation between potassium and WSOC, which again indicates the biomass nature of this. We also tried to uh, develop, so we developed a denuder, which is basically getting rid of excess gases from the particulate mixture, so that if there are positive artifacts, that is gases condensing on the filter material and getting converted to particulate, so we were able to tease out how much of that. So the actual VOC, uh, water soluble organic carbon was 16% of the total PM1 mass. And if we are not using denuder, it will be overestimated by 3%. So we showed this kind of uh, thing in one of the study. We also looked at role of uh, heterogeneous catalysis. So presence of iron, copper, manganese, and chromium, uh, especially when you have aqueous fog conditions present so these provide heterogeneous surface area on which oxidation of organic carbon happens uh, and then we have from primary organics uh, secondary organics aerosol formation take place the interesting thing was uh, this was probably one of the first studies from india where we showed dark time reaction that is night time enhancement of uh, organic aerosol because of this heterogeneous catalysis because daytime photochemistry works and you have a lot of oxidation taking place, but nighttime nobody had showed uh, before us. In fact, uh, in one of the paper, uh, my batchmate from Roorkee, Dr. Anil Kumar, helped us in finding the right 
mechanism for nitrate formation through N2O5 oxidation uh, from the gas phase to particulate phase. So we published that in RSC advances about five years ago. Uh, this was another flagship uh, kind of experiments done by us. So about a decade back in 2010-11, we got a good grant from the uh, IIT Kanpur and we were able to procure this uh, high resolution time of flight mass spectrometer. So this was first of its kind of instrument in the Southeast Asia. And what it can do is like in real time, it can sample air, uh, obviously uh, less than one micron. And then it can not only size the particle using a bunch of aerodynamic lenses, but it has a soft ionization uh, <clears throat> flash vaporizer, which is kept at 600 degrees C. So non-refractory uh, chemical composition can be obtained. And then it is coupled to a TOF mass spectrometer. So you can get uh, the time of flight information. We can have uh, two modes, V mode and W mode. So you can do bulk analysis, you can do single particle analysis. And th this is uh, very, very uh, new as far as um, any source apportionment was concerned. Again, our hypothesis was uh, a typical particle will have crustal materials, mineral dust or black carbon or some hydrocarbon like organic aerosols and then it will be coated with either sulfate, ammonium, nitrate or oxidized organic. Once this particle goes inside a fog droplet, then what happens is like some of these components will quickly dissolve because of their hygroscopicity. Some of these species will remain as interstitial aerosol inside the fog droplets. And then each fog droplet, we hypothesize, is going to work as a chemical factory where various chemical reactions are going to take place depending upon the daytime, sunlight will be there. So ozone, OH radicals might be playing the role. If it is nighttime, then there may be transition metals like iron and copper, which will provide oxidation reactions to happen. So continuously processing of organic aerosol to more oxidized forms is going to happen. And what we did was uh, we ran this uh, HR TOF AMS standalone as well as in tandem with offline measurements made from BM1 sampler. This filter was atomized using an atomizer and this atomized aerosol was introduced into the AMS. So we could do both real time as well as offline measurements for particular periods. I'm not going into the detail of how the analysis was done. But I'm just showing the snapshot. So for three different winter years, 2012-13, so these were typically November to February. So November 2012 to February 2013 and similarly November 2013 to February 2014 and so on. We see a large term. Green is the organic aerosol in the PM1 samples. A huge component of organics which are there in as far as Kanpur is concerned. So this is a setting right into the indo gangetic plane. So what we are suggesting is like these are basically for processed organics. And then among this which we see that uh, HOA is a signature from diesel vehicles or maybe uh, vehicular exhaust. BBO is biomass combustion. And OA is the secondary aerosol which are formed after the oxidation of uh, both of these. Okay, And we see that BBO is contributing large amount of it. This slide I kept just to show the how the source apportionment uh, is done using the chemical signatures. So what we have on the x-axis is the m by z fractions and uh, on the y-axis is the fraction of the signal. So for example, like there could be a molecular marker like Lebu glucosan, which is coming from, say, uh, <coughs> uh, <coughs> cow dung combustion. And it has peaks in certain uh, M by Z area, which are identified using the library which is present. And then similarly, we can identify various markers like which have been mentioned here, like CHO, N1, and so on. So, we also showed using these studies first time field measurements of organonitrates and organosulfates which are uh, present in the ambient here. Uh, fortunately or unfortunately because of high loading which we get uh, because of high pollution episode in Kanpur. 
some of these results were baffling for the international community because nobody had seen that such signals could be possible because elsewhere except for china the wherever these sophisticated instruments were there the pollution levels were very very low either in europe or north america so they never found such kind of signals uh, one of the conclusions we made from this study is like comparing no fog versus fog we see highly high amount of oxidized biomass combustion which is happening and what we also see between before fog during fog and after fog there's a net enhancement in the oxidation of organic aerosols even though this scavenging keeps on happening now i'll quickly show some of the instruments which got commercialized so pm1 sampler i had shown earlier in 2015 we transferred this technology to a company in delhi envirotech and this is a sampler which is sitting on a herschel uh, glacier in uh, uh, in himachal pradesh uh, himalayan uh, area about 100 such units have been sold to various educational institute as well as to various uh, uh, industries who work in cement and uh, other glass manufacturing areas uh, this was another such instrument which is a high volume pm 2.5 sampler we developed as a funding received from brns and three such systems were supplied back to brc to carry out a high volume study of pm 2.5 because they wanted to study the dosimetric effect of various thorium and uranium mines that we have in jadugoda and in near vishakhapatnam they wanted to study the health effects so this, this was supplied to them and just a few months ago a startup company in id kanpur has taken rights to commercialize this technology they will be bringing it out to the market they are going to do a lot of electronic data logger enhancement and so on on it including an lcd screen and so on uh, this was a study funded by uh, mhrd where we developed a robotic monitor this was actually a part of phd study of a design student uh, he defended just last month and this uh, instrument is also available for commercialization hopefully will be commercialized in the near future then uh, i had a phd student who worked on biosol uh, his whole phd thesis was to find out uh, first develop a biosol sampler where we could collect uh, airborne fungi bacteria pollens and so on and develop an inventory for it kanpur so this was a year long study that he carried out for different season and then later on he after graduation he opened up his own company nature sense technologies incubated at iit kanpur and after like producing few samples he has to be has moved on into the smart city initiative of uh, indore study indore city and he is producing smart bins uh, for collection of uh, waste from the city i am also collaborating with a startup in hyderabad uh, ayati lab so now we are moving to the next stage where like we are miniaturizing these sensors both for gas monitoring and for particle monitoring Uh, the advantage with these sensors are they are of the fraction of the cost of the uh, robust big instruments they are less bulky and can be used in large number and we can get spatial and temporal information from these so this is the future where um, everyone is moving uh, i didn't had much time to show the control technology but i just kept one slide to show the snapshot so uh, Dr. Avinash Agarwal in Environmental Engineering Research Lab at Mechanical Engineering at IIT Kanpur. So I have been collaborating with him since I joined uh, IIT Kanpur. We have like close to forty publications together. Several PhD students guided. What we looked at is the exhaust from engine emissions and to look at control technologies. So in this particular setup, you see a Tata Indica engine which is kept on a dynamometer, and we. conducted various parametric investigation to assess the performance of a diesel oxidation catalyst again the catalyst was developed at uh, dr nitin lakshetwar's lab in nagpur neri so we collaborated with him and this was also part of a phd thesis of uh, a phd student uh, pravesh shukla he is now a faculty at uh, uh, bilai iit bilai so what we looked at is uh, cobalt seria based catalyst so you know that commercial doc has platinum and palladium as the main uh, metal catalyst 
whereas we wanted to cut down the cost of the commercial doc we came up with two different catalysts one was cobalt seria based catalyst another one was lanthanum perovskite based catalyst uh, both use trace amount of palladium as a promoter so this this is the substrate which looks so basically it's a flow through uh, monolith structure which after coating with cobalt seria it looks a black color so when we had a perovskite uh, coating it showed a gray color original parent color is a cream color this is the housing in which the doc was kept and then the doc was tested so a part of engine exhaust was passed through it and then we had a partial dilution tunnel flow system where particles were collected on the filter we had some real time gas and particle measurement instrument all several uh, parametric study showed that if we put a combination of these two catalysts and small amount of commercial doc we will have performance as good as the commercial doc whereas the price will be 110th so we are not targeting uh, commercial vehicles or cars for this kind of application but maybe stationary diesel gensets so maybe for say residential power or for agricultural purposes wherever such units are actually used like diesel uh, genset we can use such kind of doc to re remove the organic fraction or the sof fraction and reduce the amount of emissions coming out from them okay so for example this tata indica was a bharat stage 2 and using a doc you can convert it to bharat stage 3 engine okay uh, these are some of the pictures from uh, rurki so there was a i think a symposium we did for uh, professor malik's uh, celebration of large number of phd guided by him in 1997 and we performed a skit and as if this was like uh, my fate got sealed so i performed as a professor there and i ended up becoming a professor so that is just to put it literally but uh, all the studies and all the strength and confidence i got both from my seniors as well as from my teachers at rurki and my from from my batchmates of course it was very very memorable and i hope uh, i was able to convey in whatever time uh, i could get thank you very much uh, questions any questions please um, Pro professor pallavi yes this is bina gupta can i say something yes sure sure yeah. uh, the professor tarun thank you for a nice and informative talk So I don't have any queries. Just I wanted to say that it is a pleasure to see our students working in such diverse fields, and they are doing so well in the field. And for you, it is good to see that you are coming from chemistry and you have made a place in civil engineering department. So I want to wish all the best for your future endeavors. And for this webinar series, I want to appreciate the efforts of Professor Justin. Who has made this possible, and so that we could interact with the old students. So, just I wanted to say this, and happy Independence Day to all. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. A nice talk. Huh? Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. I can see so many old students, so it is so good to see all of them. Okay. Thank you so much. Yes. Professor Pallavi, can I ask? Uh, sure, sure. Please, yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, Professor Tarun, this is the. Uh, Hi, Devashish. <laughs> it is really uh, very exciting and uh, very informative talk, and uh, it is uh, really for me. It was. It looks uh, ex excellent that uh, you have done so nice work, and then uh, mostly, uh, you know, the future direction of I think that uh, this, this is really very very important to us. So I have very small queries. Uh, you have mentioned uh, in your last, I think, last or couple of la before last slides that you are using the DSU uh, for a catalyst based on cobalt and ceria based, and they contain some palladium to transform maybe some diesel part something. If I correctly understand. Uh, right. Right. So, what exactly uh, the material means? What uh, this catalysts are doing basically in that uh, means uh, you are so, uh, for oxidation to some part of what exactly you are chemical right. conversion you are looking for. Right. So uh, that is the function of any diesel oxidation catalyst 
is uh, they provide the catalyst surface on which uh, oxygen is going to react with uh, volatile organic carbon so mostly aldehyde ketones which might be there in the engine exhaust could be some uh, like low molecular weight organic acids which are going to get oxidized into co2 and water and then, uh, yeah so uh, you you are using any oxygen in in do this one or do you are doing this reaction means it is going through maybe definitely higher also for that uh, you have the catalyst chamber and you are uh, i mean uh, follow this uh, transforming this one that uh, contaminated mixture to the catalyst bed or something like that uh, we are directly hooking it up to the engine exhaust so whatever oxygen content is there in the engine exhaust uh that itself is sufficient to uh, oxidize uh, the pollutant which are there remember that these pollutants are in ppm levels parts per million level and the amount of oxygen will be in percentage levels still like uh, from 21% it will reduce to a few percent and that will be sufficient because catalyst if it is heated up to a nice temperature optimum temperature it is performing the catalysis very nicely so what what the instrument does is like it has a honeycomb like structure so we provide a very large residence time through it by splitting one particular shell into several such shells okay so that yes, the yes. air is streamlined so even though exhaust stream could be of the order of 40 50 liters per minute when it is passing through a streamlined uh, way so it's like a muffler you attach to a pump right so you are muffling mm -hmm. out the sound similarly we are diversing the main flow into small several small pockets which are coated right. with catalyst so that provide enough residence time for a catalyst action to happen so what is the content the catalyst amount maybe very few milligram so like few that. milligrams yeah few milligrams uh, per uh, like uh, <clears throat> say uh, the mass of the holes i think uh, i don't remember on top of my head the exact loading yes. that it did because various uh, parametric uh, investigations were done for that but that publication will be uh, able to give yeah, you yeah i know that one yes yes, yes. i know that so all my publications are available on research gate so if you just yes, yes. go to research gate you will be able to download that yeah because i uh, remember that the bsf also some kind of dual catalytic approach they are making some uh, sort of engine kind of thing so i may contact you later with the bsf some i have some information because we are also working on cobalt and uh, this are sure. based on uh, i'll be happy to share yes, i'll be happy to share yeah, sure yes yes okay thank you thank you very much thank you thank you professor banerji professor pallavi can i interest for a while Sure, sure. This is okay. Uh, Professor Arun Gupta, this is a very nice talk. You're, I'm, I'm R K Datta speaking from Chemistry Department. Thank you. Please. Uh, yeah. So actually, being a uh, fundamentally a chemist transformed into a, a technology person, I can actually see that your research is uh, primarily technology driven. Uh, so uh, what i was just uh, wondering that uh, how about you know analyzing particle by particle okay uh, in order to understand the the chemical significance uh, of the particles on the health aspect uh, how uh, what is your opinion about that yes uh, so actually uh honestly speaking i was like say part of my phd was to develop an ultra fine particle concentrator and this was eventually used by us epa uh in their uh, research triangle park animal as well as human exposure chamber facility so there are several toxicologists who publish their research based on this instrument and they not only use ambient uh, aerosol or ambient air to look at the health effects from nanoparticle but they also try to hook up say diesel exhaust or like uh, exhaust from a cigarette smoke to study the health effects from these uh, so you can do source specific or chemical specific health effects or you can look at the synergistic effect of different chemicals or if they get aged like say coal power plant fumes as the sulfur dioxide get uh, converted to sulfur
did I lose your voice? Uh, Professor Pallavi, uh, I think there is some I think, issue. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, I think there is some bandwidth problem. Let's wait for him to rejoin. Okay, Maybe okay. there is some bandwidth problem. Yeah. Okay, fine, thank you. Professor Tarun Gupta, please rejoin. Yeah, his bandwidth is fluctuating. That is what I could see from the control, WebEx okay. control. Uh -huh. Yeah, so probably he is speaking, but it is not reaching to us. Something is there. So maybe I can reach to him in the chat box. Yeah, please. Uh, Professor Tarun Gupta, are you able to hear us? Hi, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, now we can hear you. Okay, so maybe I miss. Uh, did you heard about the series of study we did with CNG mm -hmm. gasoline? No, 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 no. Actually, we could not hear it. Okay. Anyway, I mean, you can briefly tell maybe. Right. So what we did was uh, this was about three years ago that uh, we looked at uh, the engine emissions coming out from CNG based fuel, from gasoline and diesel and biodiesel also. We collected the filters, did physical chemical analysis. Uh, we ran through a bunch of mass spectrometry to look at what are the organic compounds, what are the inorganic trace compounds. And then we also exposed these particles to uh, kidney cell lines of both uh, carcinogenic cell lines and normal cell lines in the lab of Dr. Bushra Atik in BSB department. And we could then come up with the summary that CNG are the cleanest fuel. And it is an unfortunate thing that in uh, early 2000, the Supreme Court advised that Delhi government change everything for mass uh, public transport to CNG. But it, this happened for Delhi, but NCR region, but not for the whole country. We could have reduced pollution to a large effect if, if this was followed much earlier uniformly throughout the country. So we made a political statement knowing that we have a strong scientific evidence for it. Yeah. Okay, that, that is excellent. So it was very informative. The, the, the talk was really very informative and enjoyable. Thank you, Professor Tarun. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Dattar. Anybody else has any other questions? Comments? Sorry, I want to share one thing regarding Tarun Gupta. Sure, sure, please, please. Please go ahead. Uh, Professor Tarun Gupta also was the Kanpur Zone gate talker of 1998, actually. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so I, I took the risk of going to MTech. Uh, so I would tell students that take risk, uh, go for PhD only when you are absolutely sure about it. So PhD is not uh, a last option. It is something by choice and not by compulsion. Thank you. 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 Thank you
Yes, like, Professor Gupta, I want to yeah, share yeah. also something. Following you, so your subsequent uh, juniors also did the same thing. The toppers went to IIT Bombay for environmental engineering. Yeah. A nice talk, Kartarun. Uh, as always, I think I always feel very good after hearing you. I have a general question for you. Right? In current COVID scenario, what do you think the risk of spreading through air, through aerosol? What, what's yeah. that? I'm like, there have been several studies, a recent one which came out from, uh, I think, Duke University in, co in collaboration with uh, US EPA and uh, I think the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, uh, they have actually uh, graded different masks based on their efficiency of uh, retaining, uh, say, COVID-19 particles or of that size. A person who is infected is wearing such mask, even N95, and started coughing or sneezing because of the large amount of air which comes out suddenly lot of particles which might be retained inside the matrix may get dislodged. So it can definitely infect others, even though the patient might be wearing a very strong thing. So that's why like any health worker which is going near to them must use PPE, protective instruments. And uh, there are PAFR which are also available in the market nowadays. So that is a positive pressure air using like a helmet. So it is very similar to like the space suit design that you will see in uh, movies and all. So those are the most protective ones. Uh, several collaborators at IIT Kanpur developed PPE kits and I was also involved in testing of some filter material early March because nothing was available in the country at that time. But then uh, N95 mask has been coming out uh, from IIT Kanpur, one of the startup companies. Um, yeah. So, yeah. but uh, became, definitely, became, uh, Naren, Naren Modi wearing one of those, it became famous. Yes, right. So, Sandeep Patil uh, was the person, Dr. Sandeep Patil, who, who designed that. Yeah. So, I helped him in uh, testing those samples, like uh, the filter material. Yeah. Wonderful. I, I think I took a lot of time. So, thank you, Professor Thomas, for giving that much time to me. <laughs> No problem at all. If anybody else want to share something, please continue. If anybody else want to share something, okay. Then, uh, please join me in thanking Professor Tarun Gupta for inviting us with so many promising environmental solutions. Uh, thank you, Professor Tarun. Thank you so much. Yeah. So let's introduce uh, our next speaker. Our next speaker is Dr. Amit Kumar. Okay, today he speaks on craftsmanship at nanoscale, application oriented designs of catalytic nanoreactors. His bioscape goes as follows Amit Kumar received his MSc chemistry degree from IIT Roorkee in 2004 and PhD on organic synthesis from IIT Kanpur in 2009, followed by postdoctoral research from City University of New York, USA, and Seoul National University, South Korea. He is currently working as research professor in the Department of Chemistry, Postech, South Korea, and holds his independent research funding as PI from National Research Foundation, Korea, and serving a research group as associate group leader. His major research interest is to design and synthesize advanced functional nanostructures by focusing on new nanoscale solution phase and solid state material chemistry and apply them in different fields stimuli responsive, plasmonic, magnetic, catalytic nanoreactors, chemical heat fuel nanomotors, photocatalysis, bio orthogonal catalysis, bio pheromones, stick probes, controlled drug delivery search by sensor. So over to you, Dr. Amit Kumar. Welcome. Yeah. Please. Okay, let me share my slides. Yeah. Yes, yes, we yeah. can hear you. Now we can see your slides also. Please continue. Yeah. So the full screen, my slide. Okay. Uh, no. You have to okay. Have now it's okay. Now, now it's okay. okay. 
Well, thank you, Professor Pallavi, for the kind introduction. And uh, oh. the members for organizing such a flawless and wonderful conference. And uh, I feel privileged uh, after such an invitation to share my research work at such a platform. And it's always a nostalgic feeling and wonderful feeling uh, connected back to my alma mater where I started my my academic career and I learned how to do chemistry actually. So uh, today, uh, so at post tech, uh, I am employed at uh, Department of Chemistry as a research professor and our center is funded by National Research Foundation of Korea and partly by Samsung. And we have been giving given generous support by these agencies to conduct basic research and pursue our creative ideas uh, in, in a long-term project. So, so uh, to fit into broad uh, definition of expertise, I would we would like to call us chemists uh, who are interested to discover, um, discover uh, and control nanoscale chemistry. And, and we are basically uh, motivated and inspired by natural systems, for example, compartmentalized systems, in the cells, if you if you see natural cells, they are like compartmentalized by by membrane, and such a compartmentalization is very crucial for, crucial for uh, survival and function of the cells. And even if you 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 dissect the cell and look into organelles, various organelles, they exist in the in the compartmentalized and nano confined environments and perform their function uh, flow. So in the coming uh, thir uh, 30 to 35 minutes, I will be presenting uh, the design and synthesis and function of three uh, our recently developed nanoreactors. Uh, among them, uh, two are plasmonically coupled nanoreactors and operated by um, light, and one is like magnetically coupled and activated by magnetic field. So I don't have to advocate too much uh, uh, for the for the importance of uh, catalysis, field of catalysis uh, in, in our life. So, uh, for example, the natural catalysis, enzyme catalysis is very crucial for sustaining life. And also uh, uh, the metal based catalysts are, are very important and they, they have like big applications in traditional industries, for example, petrochemical polymers, pharmaceuticals, automobiles, and they have big market. And in the coming time, in future, there is new market emerging for sustainable energy uh, production, conversion, and storage-based technology. Uh, and Korea, where and the country where I live, uh, they are they are bidding very high on on this kind of uh, development of uh, this, these technologies. So, uh, so when we when we think of designing a catalyst, the first thing uh, come to our mind is uh, natural enzymes. They seem to be perfect, actually, in performing their function. For example, if you see this, the structure of horse red peroxidase enzyme, which is uh, isolated from roots of horse red, is, uh, and it can actually perform oxidase by hydrogen peroxide. And if you see the active site the, of this enzyme, it occupies very, very tiny uh, volume of the enzyme. And most of the volume of the enzyme is occupied by complex proteins, protein structures. So broadly, if you see these structures, they look very random, but, but they have been evolved and perfected during the evolution process of billions of years. And it is like uh, crafting, uh, natural crafting of these enzymes. So if you detach these heme centers from the, these protein environments, they, these enzymes cannot function. So many scientists have paid a lot of attention how these function and what is the role of active sites. There are few researchers who have actually invoked the, the role of uh, the environment, protein environment, native environment, but uh, a lot of research uh, actually should be pursued to understand perfectly how exactly this kind of uh, compartmentalized or nano confinement, uh, confined environment is important to function the enzyme. So a uh, couple of like more than 10 years back, this paper came uh, uh, in the Nature Nanotech who invoked the enzyme-like activity of iron oxide nanoparticles, and it has got actually means to 3,000 citations so far. So, so, um, but if you compare the activity of these nanocrystals with the enzyme, the HRP can perform close to 
2 million cycles um, within five minutes of reaction time. Whereas if you compare these magnetite nanoparticles, they cannot even do one cycle uh, within that time. So compared to natural system, the synthetic systems are very, very weak uh, in the performance. But, but the development of nanoscience gives us opportunity to tune the, um, tune the activity of the catalyst. So many, there is, there is a lot of research which has taken place in last day. Many remedies to, to modify uh, the catalytic activities of nanocrystals. One of them is like controlling the crystal facets by changing their shapes and sizes and also making some binary ternary systems. Uh, for example, core shells, uh, it, it has been shown that they show very high activity on the, the, their combination, um, individual combinations. Some hetero interfaces, uh, metallic hetero, hetero interfaces, they, uh, they can actually increase the catalytic activity and also strong metal support interaction is another uh, method to increase the catalytic activity. So uh, there is, these are like common approaches by which uh, people, uh, scientists have uh, actually enhanced the catalytic activity of the catalyst in the heterogeneous state. Okay. So another uh, interesting feature of nanoparticles is that you can get additional uh, physical properties, for example, optical properties. So for example, this, uh, um, the nanoparticles of gold and silvers, they have like unique ability to absorb light and their light absorption capability can be well tuned as like you change their sizes, shapes, and, and morphologies. So, so during my postdoctoral research at Seoul National University, uh, so I had uh, extensive training in controlling their sizes and shapes uh, by various solution-based uh, methods and found that you know, controlling these structures at few nanometer scale is very, very crucial for tuning their, um, their plasmonic properties. So, when when the light is incident uh, on these nanoparticles, there are basically three effects which dominate. One is there is like uh, uh, increase in the electromagnetic field on the surface of uh, these nanoparticles. Another is, uh, another is uh, such kind of light interaction can actually excite uh, hot charge carriers and, uh, for example, hot electrons and hot holes. Those can be utilized for for chemical reaction which dominates is uh, the, the lattice of the nanoparticles that undergo vibration and there is like phonon excitation and phonon electron couplings and when the when the when the, these phonon relax they generate highly localized so these the combined effect of uh, photothermal effect and generation of charge carriers can promote chemical reactions so so imagine the scenario we combine the high catalytic activity uh, of the nanoparticles with uh, with this kind of uh, reaction promoting physical effects we can gener we can actually create a very very interesting combination of uh, designer catalyst which can be operated by light. so another interesting feature which can be included in such nanostructures is plasmonic hot spots so plasmonic hot spots are actually very narrow junctions uh, for example very, um, if you assemble nanoparticles very quickly, but not touching, or you create nano gaps or nano services, uh, this kind of can actually harness light very efficiently and generate very strong electromagnetic field. So using this knowledge, actually, in my postdoctoral research, I actually uh, created many nanostructures, for example, this kind of core petal nanostructures, if you modify simple shapes for example spheres with this kind of uh, surface uh, branches we, we call them uh, nano antenna so they show very enhanced uh, optical absorption absorption as well as scattering another in another scenario if we assemble very tiny um, uh, metal nano gold nanoparticles on the large gold core and embed some uh, biomolecules or some raman reporter they can they can show show us very very enhanced Raman signals. So the third uh, nanoprobe which I synthesized, which included two kinds of uh, plasmonically active regions. One is interior nano gap, another is this branches. So the combinedly, this this uh, actually structure can be very useful for plasmonic application. So some of these researches are already published and some are underway. So using this knowledge, uh, I I actually then moved to uh, my my current position. And here uh, we started working on completely new idea because our our purpose was 
to just to uh, use the knowledge of chemistry training advanced functional catalysts it took completely new approach for synthesizing nanoparticles so usually for the synthesis of nanoparticle is done in this kind of uh, glass vessels okay so um, everybody uses in the laboratory this kind of vials or uh, flasks which is made of um, glass which is silica basically so there is a reason for for this because silica is very inert to common chemicals and uh, you can clearly see uh, you know top it is optically transparent so we uh, developed a new idea to use uh, silica nanoparticle as a nano sized media and we feed these uh, silica nanoparticles which are less than 100 nanometer with metal and then we uh, actually subject them to various conditions in one in solid state reaction conditions we we expose them to some gaseous environment and heat them to very high temperatures and we see like when many noble transformations which can generate various morphologies of the nanocrystals and also with the hollow silica nanoparticles uh, after uh, uh, we can perform some seed mediated synthesis for example within nano confined media and also we can uh, perform some surface uh, galvanic replacement chemistry and other chemistries uh, within the within the nano size media so all these approaches actually are very different than the uh, conventional uh, ligand based synthesis of nanoparticles so in the ligand based nanoparticles uh, you add various additives reducing agents and so many other uh, complex conditions and we actually uh, don't understand uh, in the bulk reaction media what is the actually actual mechanism for nanoparticle growth and, and the resulting nanocrystal importantly is actually occupied by by complex ligands and in the in, for the catalytic applications the surface ligands can interfere during the catalytic reactions but our nano uh, confined nano space confined chemical reactions approach uh, um, it results uh, in into the surfactant free nanoparticles and those are actually very useful for as a as a as a for catalytic nanodetector and can be applied for various catalytic applications, including bio, uh, developing some nano bioimaging probes and also for some therapeutic therapeutic applications. So, so the main advantages of using this uh, uh, this approach is like uh, reaction is highly content free uh, synthesis usually, and uh, there is no sintering during the synthesis of uh, even uh, exposed to high temperature. There has been no sintering of the nanoparticle. And you can you can find some novel phenomena and discover some new mechanisms of the nanoparticle synthesis in such a condition. And uh, the chemical inertness, opticity, thermal stability, and porosity control these factors actually help us to uh, to apply these nano reactors for for broader applications. So uh, so two years back, uh, uh, I actually summarized all these strate strategies developed during the last. Uh, uh, and published it in account of chemical research. As you can see, uh, using this chemistry, we can generate various morphologies where nanoparticles are selectively uh, functionalized uh, either on the interior part or, or maybe the exterior, and we can generate various uh, structures of hollow nanospace within the silica, silica confined environment. And these nanostructures, resulting nanostructures can be actually applied for organic catalysis photocatalysis and uh, many times if you remove silica in the electrocatalysis and uh, they are highly useful uh, in many bioimaging applications and recently we found uh, them very useful in bioorthogonal catalysis uh, for for application actually we got interested into very exciting area this new, new research area which is uh, uh, developing artificial organelles and performing um, catalytic reactions in the living systems. So, so actually, it looks very simple to uh, pictorially to to draw a or a catalyst uh, with with the cells and performing some reactions. But in actual uh, scenario, or actual condition, it's highly challenging to to do some chemical reactions in in vivo or in vitro conditions. So, why why it is important to do chemical reactions? Um, in, in the in vivo in vitro systems because if we if we generate some catalysts uh, for in vitro applications or intracellular applications they can they can replace certain enzymes defective enzymes and also we can also think of doing some new to new, new to na uh, nature reactions which which are not possible by by natural enzymes 
So, so think of the scenario uh, that uh, what about uh, synthesizing uh, the drug molecule right there where it is needed. So, if we if we somehow modify these kind of nano reactors into the uh, diseased organ or disease cells, and then feed some non toxic uh, drug symptoms, and which can locally synthesize effective drugs locally, and uh, in this way we can generate new ways for targeted um, uh, therapy well-targeted therapy and also bioimaging. We can perform several kinds of reactions, uh, not only demasking of pro-drug, but also we can also imagine some cascade reactions like enzymes do. So we can uh, feed cells or in vivo systems with a couple of uh, different modular nanoreactors and perform this kind of, uh, this kind of cascade chemistry. Nanoreactors for this kind of biological biological applications, uh, because the, the media is very complex. It's not a normal normal reaction media. So we have to be uh, uh, very careful in choosing uh, choosing the material which we use for the nanoreactor synthesis. It should be highly bi biocompatible. And also the number two uh, requirement is uh, the, the catalytic site should be modified inside actually nanoreactor, and they should be surfactant free, and only selectively the drug molecules or synthone should be allowed and the pro the proteins or other interact with the uh, catalytic sites. The other part is the, the biological systems we cannot actually, uh, it's very challenging to supply additional energy. For example, in a normal condition in laboratory, if some reaction doesn't go, we simply apply thermal heating and the react we, we, we complete the reaction. But in uh, um, the system, uh, by some thermal source, so there should be some plugin by which we can remotely control uh, these chemical reactions. So, uh, in the in the very first design of such a nano reactor, uh, we thought to combine catalytic and plasmonic component, and we chose a design where the catalytic nanocrystals, which are very small in size, are embedded inside the nano reactor, and the periphery of its function. So, so you can in such a such a setup, the the plasmonic and the catalytic uh, functionalities are closely interfaced. And if you shine the light to such such system, the plasmonic corona will be activated and it will transfer the energy to the catalytic sites, and hence it will promote the chemical reaction. So this was the this was the idea. Uh, so using our knowledge of uh, knowledge of uh, chemistry. Uh, and some uh, already established methodologies, we started synthesizing like how to synthesize such a such a uh, design of the nanocatalyst. So we started with the uh, mesoporous silica uh, uh, nanoparticles, but in TM images, as you you may not see the pores uh, um, very clearly, but the, this is the, the structure of such nanoparticles is like a sponge which has uh, two to three nanometer uh, uh, pores. And by simply reducing the metal salt, right in this, uh, you can functionalize uh, this kind of very small modified into into these mesopores. And some of the nanoparticles are modified on the top of uh, um, the, these silica nanospheres. So now uh, th this is the catalytic component of the nanoreactor is ready in this way, and we don't use any any additional surfactant to synthesize such catalytic nanocrystals. So after that, uh, our intention was to selectively grow the outside uh, nanocrystal into larger, which will be like plas which will turn into plasmonic corona. So for that, actually, we coated uh, this uh, catalytic component with very thin layer of uh, uh, metal directing polymer. Uh, so we took this kind of tannic acid iron coordination polymer, which in presence of gold chloride precursor uh, deassembles and converts into these random structures. And these random structures actually guide and direct the metal growth into, into uh, these larger uh, plasmonic structures, plasmonic petals or um, nanospheroids. So, uh, so the utility of this polymer is, uh, uh, number one, it is a structure uh, guiding agent. Without that, we cannot get such kind of isolated branches around the nanoreactor. And another is, is it, it stops in uh, the internal nanocrystals, because if the internal crystals grow into larger structure, they lose their catalytic activity. 
So uh, developing this strategy is very crucial for getting actually uh, this kind of structure of final. So we <coughs> we have uh, characterized uh, the final structure as you can see uh, the outside uh, outside corona the outside periphery are functionalized with the larger um, gold branches. But but inside you can uh, I don't know whether you can see it. It is like very tiny gold nanocrystals are modified into the interior of uh, of these uh, nanostructures. And the size of a plasmonic uh, is, um, corona can be can be well controllable uh, with the dose of uh, gold chloride in this case. So structure was uh, well characterized by TEM, STM, uh, and elemental mapping. Okay, so so uh, as far as catalytic diversity is concerned, we can we can modify different uh, different types of nanocrystals, for example, palladium, gold, platinum, uh, in the interior part catalytic component uh, of the nanoreactor, uh, so to make it more versatile. Okay, so as well, uh, so here we measured the optical properties of these nanoreactors. As you can see, uh, this is uh, these are optical absorption spectra of different nanoreactors having different sizes of uh, uh, plasmonic component. So, so in the in the largest size, which is uh, which is actually, uh, you can see the the absorption is very broad and it extends into an IR region. So, such kind of NIR absorption is very crucial for biomedical applications because by uh, the tissue and cells they absorb minimally in the NIR region. And one more important uh, feature we got it their uh, dark field scattering, light scattering. As you can see, as the size of plasmonic corona increases, we we actually observe very uh, very high brightness of these structures. And such kind of brightness can be used for bioaging purposes. As far as uh, temperature increase is concerned, so the photothermal temperature uh, can be controlled based on the concentration of the particles and also by changing the uh, laser power. And also you can see the under laser radiation conditions, they can uh, this kind of uh, switching on and off laser uh, experiment can show that the photothermal effect is uh, highly reproducible. So uh, when we also measured the catalytic efficacy of pinners uh, because we, we wanted to do test them in the cells. So before that, we tested them for, for the conversion of uh, this kind of uh, um, POC protected rhodamine 110 into the free rhodamine uh, 110, which is a gold catalyzed reaction. So the gold coordinates with the with the alkyne part and uh, performs this kind of uh, deprotection chemistry. And we saw that within Within 30 minutes of the um, laser irradiation, uh, around 300 millimeters per centimeter square laser power, we could complete that into almost quantitative um, conversion. In the in the absence of laser, we don't see any conversion within within this time frame. And when the reaction is uh, heated to around 40 degrees Celsius uh, thermally, we do, we see very poor conversion. So which shows clearly shows that uh, uh, this this reaction can be selectively carried out by laser and IR laser irradiation. We also performed um, uh, several control experiments to prove that this kind of uh, interfacing of plasmonic and catalytic component is very crucial for um, for the function of nanoreactor. So we uh, try to carry it out uh, carry out the re this reaction only with the catalytic component. Uh, of silic, um, this nanoreactor, which is only uh, small nanocrystals. So the conversion was very, very low. And we separately synthesize only um, only plasmonic component uh, by, by hollow silica nanoparticles without any catalytic component inside. And we see like very low uh, reactions. So the large size plasmonic nanoparticle, nano corona cannot catalyze, alone cannot catalyze this reaction. And also, so, so this reaction can only be uh, uh, carried out when the plasmonic corona is uh, is uh, in close proximity with the catalytic component. So, um, so after uh, proving that this reaction works with the uh, uh, with pochrodamine substrate, we actually uh, we generalize. Uh, we here this was the substrate scope, uh, and we performed the uh, different chemistries with different substrates. So uh, the nanoreactors functionalize with gold, palladium, and uh, platinum. This uh, platinum 
also we have since the platinum also can can transform uh, can can perform several type uh, different type of reactions uh, and uh, giving and short short reaction times to treat these nanoreactors with the cells that was the ultimate actually goal that uh, whether these uh, nanoreactors can enter uh, inside these nanoreactors can enter inside actually uh, uh, cells so we feed uh, the cells different cells with the nanoparticles at different times and we saw that 3 hours are enough to internalize sufficient amount of uh, um, uh, nanoreactors into the cell and then we irradiate uh, an nir laser laser to test whether um, nir laser uh, cannot affect uh, the cell viability and so 3 hours incubation time was actually optimum to to for the for the 100% almost 100% cell survival and also we optimize the laser power so 300 milliwatt per centimeter square was the optimum laser power for such a reaction so in the middle actually you see the dark field images uh, and all light uh, which you see um, actually red light so, so this light is due to cells also, and the dots, the bright dots which you see are actually plasmonic nanoparticles. So here the nanoparticles have intrinsic actually uh, um, uh, visibility in the dark field microscopy. And finally, we also located these cells in, in the fixed and sectioned uh, TM of fi fixed and sectioned cells, and they can, they can the intracellular region. So after feeding the uh, cells with the nanoreactors, Piner, we actually uh, we shine the laser. Uh, we we first we feed the reactant, uh, which is uh, protected rhodamine one one zero, for uh, for five to six hours, and then we wash away the extra uh, nanoparticles and also uh, extra fluorophore. And then we shine the laser for for uh, some time, and we see that after laser irradiation, we clearly see uh, the green fluorescence emerging from the cells, which is actually synthesis uh, due to the synthesis of fluoro, uh, uh, free fluorophore from the protected fluorophore. And uh, without laser, there is no uh, there is no emergence of such green fluorescence, which clearly tells that reaction um, the intracellular reaction can only take place uh, in the presence of laser. So this figure shows actually that uh, reaction can be selectively activated in the selected population of the cells. So by, by shining the laser on the selected part and uh, the cell population can activate uh, the fluorophore in the selected region. So it shows that uh, the local selectivity of this, uh, this chemistry. So uh, reaction can be controlled uh, when, uh, when you control the reaction time. So at, at different times uh, the um, the confocal suggest so from confocal microscopy we have seen the extent of reaction can be changed so so the yield of the reaction can be well controllable uh, with the reaction times so as you can see so so as the time goes by the the green punk, uh, green spots emerge uh, as a result of uh, the chemical reaction which is performed by pioneer inside cell okay so this uh, paper was published um, it came on the cover of uh, ACS catalysis. Okay, so uh, we were happy that uh, we could successfully on a uh, um, compartment and built a nano reactor, which was highly useful in bioorthogonal chemistry. But uh, but we we wanted to further increase the plasmonic effect and modify the catalytic site uh, right in the in the hot spot regions. So, because in the in the last design, uh, the uh, the catalytic component was actually segregated from the plasmonic component. So we come up with a new idea. So let's uh, let's this time modify uh, le let's this time modify the catalytic site into hot spot regions. So for that for that uh, actually, so we uh, we synthesize the bi bi layers. We call them nanocatalysomes, which look actually very similar to the natural exosome structures. Bilayer structures are very common in biology, and we actually modified these bilayer structures with different catalytic nanocrystals right in the hot spot regions, and for catalytic applications. 
and uh, as so these are the tm images of uh, different bilayer structures so in the in the first row there are like gold bilayer uh, platinum bilayer and pd bilayer and also uh, after synthesis of gold bilayer they can be uh, further uh, actually uh, modified with the catalytic uh, platinum um, nanocrystals, very small nanocrystals. And using our methodology, we could selectively synthesize uh, uh, catalytic uh, um, catalytic nanocrystals right in the cavity within the bilayer, which we bilayer, functionalized bilayer. So, so the size of uh, nano uh, plasmony nanoparticles modified within can be well controllable, and um, and the and the optical absorption correlates with the size of uh, these nanostructures. And we also uh, saw we also uh, verified the position of uh, plasmonic hotspots by SARS spectroscopy, surface enhanced Raman scattering. So we modified this Raman reporter into the bilayer space with with the uh, efficient gold sulfur chemistry, and found that when when the uh, when the um, in the bilayer the nano, the gold units are very closely spaced and larger in size. Such kind of structure shows highest intensity of the Raman signals. And uh, 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 previous reports, we could also uh, calculate that therm what will be the thermal localized heat generated during the laser irradiation. And we found that temperature can actually reach around 150 to uh, 180 uh, degrees Celsius in the, in the largest structure. When we shine laser, although in the in the bulk solution the temperature was uh, actually very low, around 35 to 40 degrees Celsius, but uh, Raman spectroscopy actually suggested us a temperature, local temperature can actually reach very very high, and this FTDT simulation actually uh, is is a calculation. So so it also located the position of uh, um, um, hot spots in the in the bilayer um, uh, region of the nano nan nanoparticle. And as compared to the simple sphere of the same size, the, the electromagnetic field concentration is very, very high in such structures. So uh, then we applied these bilayer structures to for, uh, for dehydrogenation reactions. And such kind of dehydrogenation reaction is very useful for generating hydrogen gas um, as, a, as a sustainable fuel. And found that 700 milliwatt per centimeter, centimeter square Solar light uh, with the help of solar simulator, uh, we could we could transform uh, within within 30 minutes. Uh, the the yield of the reaction is almost 100 percent. And we uh, here as compared to the previous report, such transformation had been tried by various catalysts. It required very high temperatures and very long reaction times. But using the, this this kind of uh, plasmonic plasmonic interfacial chemistry, such reactions can be carried out. So the reaction temperature was not very high. It was so using several elements, uh, we actually proved that uh, bilayer uh, is actually crucial for such a high reactivity. And uh, as you can see, this is substrate scope uh, for for such a reaction. So various uh, various precursors can be converted into dehydrogenated dehydrogenated forms. And uh, and the okay. So next reaction we tried with the with the CC cross cut reaction. So palladium can uh, actually generate biaryl uh, structures uh, very efficiently uh, within ten to fifteen minutes of reaction times and the irradiation of uh, very low uh, solar solar power. And as compared to the traditional uh, catalysts, which are like only palladium nano uh, particles on charcoal or palladium supported on gold nano rod, the, the reactivity of such bilayer structure was very, very high. So this is the substrate scope and turnover frequencies uh, for, for these substrates. The third reaction we tried is the alkynyl uh, annulation reaction, which is a cyclization reaction, gold, uh, gold catalyzed cyclization reaction. And uh, 
uh, and the, this kind of cyclization is uh, it generates various uh, fluorescent molecules uh, which are actually uh, very useful for bioimaging applications so uh, so using using versatile uh, customization uh, of of these kind of uh, plasmonic bilayer structures we can perform different kind of chemistry uh, this this paper was published in angiovanti chemi and it came it came as a as a main cover uh, of the issue uh, okay so the third, uh, which is like final part of uh, my presentation is we, we actually thought uh, instead of light, can we apply magnetic field to induce actually intracellular chemical reaction? Because magnetic field is extensively, uh, and it is very benign for, for actually um, biological conditions and the strength of the field and the magnetic hypothermia is easily controllable. So we thought to modify uh, the catalytic sites uh, interfacial to the to the magnetic nanocrystal, and when you apply alternating magnetic field to such a system, it can generate localized uh, magnetic heating, and which can promote chemical reaction. So for for synthesis of such a structure, we first synthesize this hollow uh, silica. Uh, in, um, which which includes the uh, Fe3O4 uh, paramagnetic um, iron oxide core, and uh, we feed this nano reactor with the palladium uh, precursor and apply AMF. And the AMF can uh, locally heat this nanoparticle and actually reduce uh, palladium precursor to generate palladium nanocrystals right on the surface of uh, magnetic core, only inside. So, so in this way, we don't util, use any le additional ligands or anything. Uh, so only ethylene glycol was used as a solvent, which is also reductant, thermally activated uh, reducing agent. So as you can see, this is uh, the TM images uh, are like time dependent um, reaction monitoring. So the first, the uh, time, this is A is uh, hollow silica and inside there is iron oxide nanoparticle. And after uh, after mixing with palladium precursor, we we see like formation of these kind of dots, uh, which could be like palladium two species aggregated. Some time we see um, the emergence of uh, small nanocrystals, palladium nanocrystals, which convert finally convert into a single uh, palladium nanocrystals located onto the magnetic core. And using only thermal heating could generate palladium nanocrystals non-specifically throughout on the silica uh, surface, which was not desired. So it shows the utility of magnetic field in synthesizing such a nano structure selectively only inside silica. And the, the structures were uh, characterized by various techniques, uh, including chemical XPS based chemical characterizations and also XRD characterization. So finally, uh, we uh, tested uh, these uh, magnetically operated nano reactors for conversion of uh, this kind of alkynyl uh, substrate, alkynyl uh, annulation, which is catalyzed by palladium. And in presence of uh, AMF, uh, the reaction completes within within one hour. Uh, and by uh, conducting control experiment only with iron oxide or palladium. Uh, uh, nanocrystals, uh, the, it resulted very poor yields. So, so the interface of palladium and uh, magnetic core was very crucial for successful uh, reaction. Then finally, we also conducted these reactions in complex media, for example, various buffers or protein solutions, including cell, cell growth media. And we saw that there is like uh, no effect on the reactivity of the nano reactor because the, in the complex media proteins cannot approach to the catalytic site. So these are very useful, uh, potentially useful for biological applications. This is a substrate scope. Uh, so we could convert various substrate into the cyclized product uh, within, within one hour, all the reactions. And, uh, and the bulk temperature was very, very low, which is good for, for their biological applications. And here, as you see, uh, some substrates we used uh, uh, with the long chain and long chains actually increases the bulkiness of the substrates. And, uh, and with, with such a bulky chain, maybe these molecules 
cannot approach to the inter internal part of, um, of the nanoreactor, it proves that porosity of the silica is crucial for, for uh, selective accessibility to the catalytic sites. Then we feed uh, cancer cells, uh, which is MCFs, with the, these nanoreactors and located them uh, with the help of uh, TM. We could visualize that these uh, nanoreactors are actually uh, located in the intracellular regions and cell viability were, uh, viabilities were tested. And uh, we found that silica confined uh, actually nanostructures are much more uh, biofriendly as compared to the naked iron oxide palladium nanocrystals. <clears throat> So these are like high resolution uh, live cell um, uh, confocal images of the of the cells fed with nanoparticles. We could locate. Uh, so we modified these uh, nanoparticles with the FITC dye and try to locate where actually they go after intercell internalization. So in the Z scan uh, CL, CLSM image, we could clearly locate that the position of the nanoparticle is not on the membrane; it is actually inside. And they uh, with the so the red colored spots are actually uh, lysosomes. So we so we visualize them with the lyso tracker dye, and we could see that some of the particles actually uh, um, also present in lysosomes. So maybe the possible pathway of internalization of such particle is endocytosis, and then endos endosomes actually fuse with the lysosomes uh, in the final stages. So after uh, internalization of these magnets, we applied the magnetic field and we saw actually uh, very strong green fluorescence after, after um, 30 minutes of EMF application. But without EMF, there was like very weak uh, fluorescence coming out of the cells. So clearly the reaction was actually uh, carried out by, by magnetic field applications. Uh, and uh, so such uh, so such nanoreactors are actually highly used logical applications about reactions inside cell. So th this uh, paper is recently ASAP uh, uh, in the nano letter, and it is also uh, came as a as a cover. So this field is uh, very exciting and emerging as an important area of research, and uh, and it involves actually uh, uh, the interdisciplinary knowledge of uh, organic chemistry, nanoscience, biology. So there are many disciplines which mix into, into, the, into getting expertise for such a, such a field. So uh, my training actually initially, I started my PhD as a, as a organic chemist. And uh, during my postdoctoral research, I moved to Seoul National University. And I got very excited with the nanoscience emerging field of nanoscience and perfected the art of synthesizing nanocrystals uh, with great deal and spent uh, uh, many years uh, in learning how to how to do nanoscience in, in a perfect way. And after that, uh, now in this field, uh, I feel very confident uh, in that we can do really good. And uh, I invite actually uh, in actually India, uh, many, many groups are doing wonderful. collaboration actually uh, th this and, uh, I entered into IIT Roorkee and it I can see many many familiar faces and many professors actually still active in Department of Chemistry Professor U.P. Singh, uh, Professor M.R. Moria, Professor R.N. Goyal, Professor Ravi Bhushan, Professor Anil Kumar, yeah, so these these faces I can recognize. I think the rest of uh, professors have already retired, and uh, this um, photo is actually during our intro party. Uh, we, we used to call that, that intro. So this is our batch. We used to have uh, some fun uh, outside campus so i don't know whether now it is allowed to go to to the bank of uh, solani river but we used to go uh, there for some uh, party uh, chapo we used to call it chapo that time this is uh, 2004 if i remember correctly uh, saraswati temple and uh, with our juniors and batchmates are some very 
nice memories. Uh, this is from intro party. So, so the dress code for juniors was only white, white shirts. It was very interesting. And uh, this is, uh, I think, uh, room of Ganga Bhavan. I don't know whether now carrying bicycle into the room is allowed or not. It's, so some actually, uh, so this is me with uh, my my friend in front of Saraswati Temple. And last year I met him after 15 years in San Diego, USA. And he did not change much, almost same. Uh, so now we have a WhatsApp group for our class and uh, we are in, you know, most of us are actually in that WhatsApp group and it's very active. And recently we had a Zoom meet together. Everybody, almost everybody participated. So now actually, uh, Rurki has very specific place um, because uh, I met my life partner, uh, you know, in Rurki, and uh, I got married, and now I have two daughters uh, in Korea. So this is 2020 this year image. So now I work in Postec. It's very interesting place to to do research. Uh, great facilities, great infrastructure, and very peaceful campus, green campus, and uh, we see all the weathers. Um, so any prospective PhDs or postdocs are welcome to apply uh, and they can contact me for any help. And, uh, and also, uh, I'm so much interested in if some faculty members are uh, interested to collaborate. And very happy Independence Day to you all. And uh, coincidentally, Korea shares Independence Day with India. The, the day is very same, like 15 August. So in Korea also, today is Independence Day. Although year is uh, different. So thank you so much. Uh, this was my talk. Yeah, the session is open for questions, comments. Please, please, Professor Binan. Hello. I see. Okay. Hello. Yeah. Hello, Amit. Hello. Yeah. Uh, Nitin here. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, Amit, very good work, Amit. Thank you. You, you all lot like after this your lab, you and within this your lab, you all lot. So I have yeah, one yeah. or two questions. So, uh, so I have one or two questions. Uh, first is like general inquiry, like uh, how this magnetic nanoparticle have this enzyme activity. Ah, so this enzyme activity actually comes from possibly uh, from iron two and iron three side. Because actually, mm -hmm. three or four has both uh, actually active site, and uh, the exact me mechanism could be very complex. But uh, mm -hmm. this is basically Fenton Fenton kind of reaction, uh, decomposition mm -hmm. of um, uh, hydrogen peroxide into radicals. Okay. This is similar. Yeah. But this is known like this example. Uh, this uh, mechanism known or like is uh, still pending. Uh, this mechanism uh, at heterogeneous surface, it it has not studied uh, people get actually reactivity and uh, that's it not much work has been done in understanding actually uh, on the heterogeneous surface actually many papers uh, for example this paper uh, njuventi kami they are basically contradicting uh, the name of this nature nanotech they are saying the actual participating catalytic species could be homogeneous which leach out during the chemical reaction so they made this case and due to that, actually, the the turnover number is very very low for for nanoparticles. So there there are various possibilities, mechanistic possibilities. And the second thing, like it's the rhodamine one one zero deproduction thing, like yeah. you are deproducing the fog from the rhodamine mm -hmm. by this uh, nano catalyst. Uh, yeah. So uh, this is a very interesting thing, like to do. It. But I'm just a little curious, like what is the role of uh, your uh, at least, uh, or what is the role of NIR in this? Because so, uh, you are using, you can, yeah. So, what is the actually, role? yeah, as you can see in the TM images of our catalyst, uh, so so the, in the outside part of the catalyst, there are like plasmonic uh, um, is nanospheroids, which get activated in the presence of light. So they, they can supply some localized photothermal effect to the catalytic sites. So that's that's why the reaction actually is promoted by, by the NIR light. 
No, exactly. Uh, my point is like whether we can use the uh, goal narrow road place of this P N I E R. Would they give the N I when you give N I R they generate the heat? Yeah, right. So, okay. gold nanorod, yeah, yeah, gold nanorod photothermal conversion efficiency is very low. We, we actually compared the photothermal conversion of our structure as compared to gold nanorod. It's, it's very, very uh -huh. low. So you may you may require maybe higher laser powers for, for okay. activating gold nanorod. Yeah. So only the like you made uh, you made from uh, with uh, like UV UV to uh, NIR like the plasmonic from starting from like five twenty to seven hundred. So only the seven hundred yeah. will work. No, other other will not work. Right. 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 Okay. Seven eighty five. I think. Okay. 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 And this uh, silica uh, porous silica. Do this uh, this particles uh, this uh, whole size have a role in the uh, your catalysis? Oh, yeah, this is very cool. So so if if we take like airtight silica, highly condensed, so the molecules cannot enter yeah. into the interior. So we actually uh, we 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 are expert in controlling the the porosity of this, which is gatekeeper actually, in accessing the catalyst. Mm -hmm. So, so by by hydraulic conditions, by is it by BT? BT, okay, okay, okay. So you analyze the pore size uh, BT. Okay. Yeah, I'm done. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. This is Sadhu. Okay, uh, Amit, thank you for the nice presentation. Hi, uh, Kalyan. It's nice hi. meeting you after a long time. Yeah, 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 yeah definitely. And a nice piece of work. So uh, it's really interesting. I, I just have, maybe I have missed out uh, in your ACS catalysis paper, just yeah. the finer thing. What is the dimension of each, say, each of the particles? So uh, the dimension overall uh, size is along, around 100 nanometer. So and yeah. the size of plasmonic component 15 nanometer, 15 uh -huh. size, and the yeah. cat catalytic nanocrystal size is around two nanometer. Yeah. So my idea is the overall, if it is 100 nanometer, my question is that if you are using for the cell, do you think that overall this 100 nanometer thing goes inside and does the chemistry or it is a part yeah, it yeah. goes inside no it actually it it goes inside so we quantified okay. actually how many how many nano particles actually enter inside okay cell. so, so by, a, yeah. a, you have shown some tm image within the yeah. uh, that cell yeah. uh, right. do you have any idea means can you comment on that which location it is inside the cell actually in this uh, tm image it may be endosome it may it be endosome. Yeah, the yeah. reason why I'm asking because in your next slide you have shown that uh, cell imaging where we could see the imaging in the nucleus. Okay. That, uh, yeah. Yeah. That marching. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That march image with that green and blue yeah. in the yeah. right topmost corner. So where mm -hmm. I could see the image in the nucleus and the nucleus membrane allows the part which is about no, nine no, no, meter no. dimension. So that is the question is, mm -hmm. yeah. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this, uh, sorry, I forgot to tell. So this is actually the nucleus are intentionally stained with DAPI. Uh -huh. So so just to locate the cells, it's, it's yeah. not, it's not, uh, it's not no. coming from the chemical reaction. Yeah. No, no, that I understand. The, the yeah. thing is in the last, I means the right hand top corner that March right. is. Yeah. See that DAPI and that green images are merged, right? Right. So right. that means that the green signal is going coming from the nucleus. So, so for I need to show microscope image. It's not uh, confocal yeah. image. So that yeah, but, so the resolution is because not that is high. my question that. Yeah, yeah. At least fifty percent of the cell, I could see it is coming from the nucleus. The mm, imaging. Right. Okay, I could understand that there are few cells where it is not marked, but here yeah. at least fifty percent is marked. 
So that is my question that how does it occur inside the nucleus? Because the nuclear membrane is only nine nanometer, means it allows about nine nanometer particle. So yeah, so we don't think actually the particles enter into nucleus. You think that yeah. it, the reaction takes place and then molecule goes inside the nucleus and then you get this image. No, no, actually, no, no, no. In nucleus, I think, may not allow the entry of uh, the, the released yeah. fluorophore. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I was just curious because even in the right hand side, that the green images right. suggest right. that uh, something is in the nucleus. Maybe I mean, this, maybe, yeah, this some of merging two images. So, in okay. one case, maybe the green, green contrast is too high to show you blue. So, in some cases. <laughs> Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, maybe that uh, better resolution will help you yeah. understand. Yeah. And that second question is for that magnetic issues. Yeah. That I'm curious to know that whether it is possible to do live cell imaging with this magnetic thing. Means what oh. you have done after thirty minutes, you have measured. Right. So whether yeah. we could measure continuously, is it possible to have those set up? Actually, we are building that setup. <laughs> you are right. So we, our interest is to monitor the reaction in live cell. But okay. uh, right now, we are building a microscope on the top of uh, EMF. Yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah. Nice to yeah. hear your work. Thanks. Thanks. I'm done, Professor Yeah. Uh, yes. Anybody else? Any other questions, please? Okay, uh, 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 Dr. Ahmed, I have one question. What is the role of laser in this? So laser uh, is basically for plasmonic excitation. So as I as I explained that uh, one component of the nanoreactor uh, gets activated uh, by laser. And that uh, excitation of plasmonic component, which is like larger gold nanostructures, they generate localized photothermal effect and also may generate which are useful in promoting localized chemical reactions. Okay, now when you say localize, how do you localize your nano reactors in the cell? So how do you guide at the desired place or you trust on the mm. diffusion in the cell? So right now, actually, we have not performed this selective targeting uh, with these nano reactors, but definitely these uh, the, the surface of these nano reactors can be modified by some target which can target selectively the cancer cells. It is possible. Such chemistries are already known. So, so but in our case, we have not targeted them to, to particular cells. We just simply feed uh, cells with these nanoreactors and cell can, can internalize these, these nanoparticles. Okay. But the cellular uptake, yeah, cellular uptake of cancer cells is uh, very high as compared to normal cells. Yeah. Any reason for that? It may be, yeah, it may be related to the metabolic activity of cancer cell, possibly. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Comments? If there are no comments, then yes, any comments? If there are no comments, then... Mm. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Yes, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Amit, yeah, I just yeah, I am one of the batchmate of uh, Amit, and I just wanted to congratulate you, Amit, for such a wonderful work. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, I'm so happy to see those photographs, which I actually I do not have. So, <laughs> so okay. So just yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for that wonderful piece of work. To show. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, any other note of appreciation? Okay. Okay, so please join me in thanking Dr. Amit Kumar for his exciting work on nano reactors. Uh, it's over to you, Professor Thomas. Yeah, thank you very much for Professor. Pallavi Debnath for nicely chairing this morning session. And I'm also very much thankful to the speakers of the morning session, Professor Tarun Gupta and Dr. Amit Kumar 
for the nice presentation on the you know pollution control and uh, giving some understanding on the particles playing you know roj major role in our health aspects and also thankful to dr amit for giving a nice presentation on the catalyst design using nanoparticles particularly biocatalyst and related topics uh, with this note of thanks i would like to conclude this morning session and i also want to request all the alumni members who are present in this meeting i have shared a link to register uh, for alumni we want we want we wish to collect the contact details of the alumni so that in the future if there is a development at the department we can share with you uh, this a uh, link is available in the youtube uh, video section also and we will be also sending to all the speakers by email you can share with your other alumni contacts so that they can also participate in the registry of alumni at the department level and with this i conclude this session we will meet you meet all of you again in the session 12 in the evening at 4 pm we have special lectures by dr anubhav saxena on the career options for chemistry graduates please join us in the evening at 4 pm thank you very much thank you